Things from Santa Barbara. I wish I could be there with you, but it wasn't possible, but I'm very grateful to Luke Fiddler for inviting me to be part of this round table. And I'm very admiring of Luke, especially for the work he's done with his fellow graduate students at the University of Chicago to unionize uh, the teaching assistants there. My remarks for this panel, um, which is sponsored by the Material Collective, relative to medieval studies and public discourse, mean saying something about medieval studies scholars and activism both within and outside the academy proper, especially in the wake of all the upheavals in our field over the past two and a half years relative to issues of racism, misogyny, sexism, homo and transphobia, disability, exclusivity, bad appropriations of the field's subject matter, and so on. These remarks also touch upon something I don't think we talk about enough when we talk about scholarship, public intellectual life, activism, and all the entangled relations therein. How do we want to live? How are we living? How will we thrive and not just survive? I want to start with an epigraph from Jean-Luc Nancy's The Inoperative Community. But if this world, even though it has changed, proposes no new figure of community, Perhaps this itself teaches us something. We stand perhaps to learn from this that it can no longer be a matter of figuring or modeling a communitarian essence in order to present it to ourselves and celebrate it, but that it is a matter rather of thinking community, of thinking its insistent and possibly still unheard demand beyond communitarian models or remodelings Nothing has yet been said. We must expose ourselves to what has gone unheard in community. I have a fortune cookie that I taped to my computer about four or five years ago where I can read it every day. It says endurance and persistence will be rewarded, which relates also to one of my favorite epigrams from Plutarch. Perseverance is more prevailing than violence, and many things which cannot be overcome when they are together yield themselves up when taken little by little. On some days when things aren't going so well, I want to place another fortune next to endurance and persistence will be rewarded. That reads in the fashion of a repost, or maybe not. Because the reality is that all of my work with open access publishing and punctum books, as well as my activist scholarly work, takes place in the space between the two and could never really be said to be dependent on either conclusion. That makes the work sometimes hard, but also really joyful. Because I don't want to or have to be dependent on either outcome being 100% or 80% or any percent likely which takes a lot of pressure off and allows work to unfold in a dimension of possibilizing, where everything is always something on its way to something. And you can just dig into the moments of making, thinking, working, acting, etc., which is often really fun if you like what you do, even when the work is hard. This doesn't mean you don't have goals. This doesn't mean that you need goals, you do, for inspiration, for forward momentum, although why not go backwards or around and around, regression can sometimes be as valuable as progression. But we do need goals for strategic planning. And this doesn't mean that you don't ever lose hope or never get depressed or never lose momentum. These things will always happen if you actually care about things but they don't become intransigent states of mind or affairs, at least we hope not. This also relates to something Sarah Ahmed wrote about in The Promise of Happiness, a book that explores, importantly, the relations between affect, subjectivity, and citizenship, where she reminds us that the root of the word happiness is hap, meaning chance, luck, fortune, whim, etc., there is no guarantee of happiness, and actually, the modern novel and other more social scientific studies show that getting what one supposedly wants almost never leads to happiness, but only to more unhappiness. What might be more conducive to happiness relative to that whimsical hap? 
is simply an always endless horizon of possibility and possibilizing. This is terrible possibilizing. Having something on the horizon that one feels is worth working toward, even if it is never attained, is a queer form of happiness, which becomes not an object we attain, but an activity that we work at every day. This daily activity of possibilizing is also the best site for progressive political struggle on behalf of those who have been marginalized, who might also be ourselves, because it doesn't allow us to become complacent as if we have achieved some sort of social justice milestone that means everyone can just relax and enjoy their new supposed privileges, which would be deadly. There is always someone who has been ignored, left behind, silenced, turned away from, often typified as too difficult, too angry, too recalcitrant, beyond placating, etc. Ahmed's feminist killjoy is the apt figure here, as is the sad lesbian, the angry black woman, etc. And I follow the idea that the individual and the singular creature is the indivisible and sacred unit of any democracy. Another way of saying this would be to also remember that the position of the minority is always where you go to find the most radical forms of challenge and resistance to any majority group or majority position that somehow feels its accomplishments, no matter how partial or provincial, are always enough or good enough. You cannot rest on any of your laurels. There is always more to be done, more to attend to, while also embracing the hap of your aliveness. The work, as Arnya Fredenberg once wrote in Discontinuity, A History of Dreaming, is to keep moving, but also to keep living. This also means that even the most radically progressive forms of social and political activism have to be open to a continual series of upheavals of thought from within and without. And by being open to a continual series of upheavals of thought, I do not mean we have to listen to internet trolls and the like, please, never. But rather that we have to be open to having our self-soothing pieties upended by those who also desire progressive change, who may also be hurting and whom we are not listening to, but also by those whom we consider our closest activist colleagues who might be trying to tell us that there is something we have neglected to say, neglected to do, neglected to enable. There are no safe spaces, no secure spaces, and there never will be. Although we do have to commit ourselves endlessly to creating spaces where people feel more safe than they do now. And free speech does not mean all speech is equal or worthy of tolerance. And it is worth adding that there is no such thing as academic freedom, period, supposedly guaranteed by tenure. It is not even a right. And it is obscene in my mind to claim it as a right guaranteed by tenure when so many people within the academy are blocked from tenure. How did academic freedom become a privilege? And what kind of sick freedom is this? What academic freedom is instead is a kind of practice that we have to work at vigilantly every day for ourselves and for others to establish the means, spaces, and mechanisms with which anyone, anywhere at all, could exercise their so-called academic or any other sort of freedom. We have to speak out and engage in what Foucault called fearless speech. And if you are not risking something, your job, your career, your status, your life, your power, in this speech, then it is not only not fearless, it is not even effective. Saying that once you have tenure, then you will stick your neck out is what I would call a belated return on an always already worthless investment of your time. Fearless speech is not safe, and those with any sort of authority or status at all must risk that authority and status. And because I am sick and tired of hearing people say at conferences for the past 20 or so years that people with tenure are the ones to need, who need to open certain doors so that progressive institutional changes can emerge, those without authority and status must also speak out. You must not wait to speak out and simply do things and build things and make things happen 
before getting permission from those with status. We have to do this not because someone with authority made it safe for us to do so, but because we have no choice and any other form of life literally feels unlivable in the extreme. We need allies in this sort of work, of course we do. And here, those in positions of authority can assist, but mainly they need to listen and to also intervene when someone is being harmed and cannot defend themselves or shouldn't have to. As Arnia Freidenberg has also written in her essay, Living Chaucer, what enables us to risk change is the feeling that we are accompanied. So let's embrace our precarity while also paying better attention to the precarity of others and dispense with our fears, especially as they relate to careerism, institutionality, and supposed ultimate end games. In order to speak out, publicly and often against those who would misappropriate the field of medieval studies in the vein of white supremacist, neo-fascist, etc. agendas, but even more importantly, to speak out against those who actively sponsor and covertly condone or are indifferent to the abuse of others within our field by our very own colleagues, in which cases bland statements of diversity and inclusivity are like the wet rags of insufficiency. And let's also make things and build things, ideally with others, in asymmetrical collaborations that would practice what Aaron Manning has called an ethics of contact and response, where we work toward a democracy without symmetry, an infinite alterity, a movement that invents divergent positionalities that converge and make contact, but that eventually disperse. Let's work harder at giving each other the actuality of possibility and possibilizing. For when we lose possibility, we lose our queer happiness, which is to say we lose the sort of work and labor that allows us to always be going somewhere. Speaking of which, I want to end with a plea for us to also work harder on intellectual and activist communities that, as Bill Reddings has written, would abandon both expressive identity and transactional consensus as a means to unity. This is what we need to abandon, and which would also commit themselves to a certain rhythm of detachment and detachment, which is designed to not let our projects sink into routine. We need to be going somewhere, but we can also let go of things while refusing to give up. Thank you.